Thanks for joining, especially some of the panelists. We got a few other people who will jump on here. We'll ask for some input. Um, do we want to go through our, our updates real quick? I don't have anything from the NSCA. Sam, do you have anything collegiate wise? Obviously, there's that announcement from OUA and U Sports. I saw it yesterday or the day before. Is that further impacting things at all? Yeah, so as you guys probably saw, U Sport announced their cancellation of all 2021 national championships. Uh, the regions are still looking to make their own decisions. Uh, the OUA did announce that it will also cancel their 2021 winter competitions. Um, although they put an asterisk at the end that some of you guys might be aware of that they can overturn the decision at any time if things do change. So although, you know, I think that was meant for some hope, uh, you know, I think it's pretty, uh, pretty slim. Um, each university is also uh, at their own discretion with respect to holding exhibition games, but are being advised to compete if they are going to compete uh, with more local programs if they choose to do so. So, you know, if we were in Toronto, it'd be your York Ryerson, you know, Toronto type stuff. Um, but who knows if that's ever going to be a possibility for the winter. Can West, I know I talked to Joe, Joe and he said uh, they're postponing their decision about Can West championship stuff uh, until mid-November. So they're, they're going to wait a little bit longer to make their decision. Um, and then the RSEQ is yeah, just blown up as usual. Um, it looks like they're going to try and try something, but uh, they're getting a lot of pushback now from uh, from the actual the Canadian government, which is going to be really interesting to see they'll fall on that. On the Ontario front, uh, we had a bit of a discussion before we got started here, but uh, the government shut down indoor gyms in Toronto, Ottawa, and Peel. Um, so that leaves us at York here uh, back outside as you know Carlton's on here too and they said they're shut down and same uh, same with U of P um, and I imagine Ryerson kind of falls suit but I think I'm going to be able to open up my own moving company at the end of this for my That's good. I'm getting really good at it um, but other than that uh, I think the impact we'll see is that double cohort next year as we've been talking about a little bit interesting to see recruiting wise and how that pans out but um, as Trevor, Trevor just mentioned, he's got a couple 10 year old weightlifters that are starting up in his place. So maybe it'll also be an upkick, but there's nothing else for everyone to do. So it's probably a good time for us to have this discussion because it looks like people are looking for things to do. Why not work out in the gym? That's all I got. Yeah, from the CSCA, uh, a few things going on. Our annual general meeting will be on November 29th. We have the agenda set up for it. We have a uh, keynote opening remarks by Scott Livingston, uh, closing marks remark by Ed McNeely. They're gonna give little mini presentations. We have the agenda set up. We'll have each of the separate committees talking. We're gonna approve bylaws. We're having voting for directors. Uh, the directors are what make up the executive board. Uh, and then set out established guidelines in terms of reference for each of the committees in full and some strategic planning for the upcoming year. So that's on November 29th, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, the CSCA newsletter is pretty much ready to go, a fall newsletter, the theme is pro sport. I've read some of the articles, they're okay. Yeah, some good stuff there, interesting. Um, we'll probably release it in two different sections because we have five different parts. And then what's interesting in there, and we're probably, you're going to get a series of mails and please share this with as many people as you can, is we're going to try and do a demographic survey of strength conditioning in Canada. Uh, this is being led by Jordan Foley. It's kind of part of his master's project, but it uh, really breaks down who's doing what, who's getting paid for what, you know, what your education is, all that kind of thing. We're trying to get a picture of what is currently going on in Canada how that compares with other countries, and then that will help us guide. It's a census of sorts that will help us guide um, uh, our decision-making in the future for sure. So really want to encourage people to take a minute and do that. It's probably a full 15 minute or uh, so set aside that time and then make sure you get any of your interns or young strength coaches to do it. Um, you'll, you'll see it kind of delineates once, if you haven't been in the field for years, there's certain different questions you'll do. Anyway, uh, on the other CSCA front, um, if you're interested in serving on the advisory panel and not, you aren't currently, you can reach out to some of the CSCA directors, Sheldon Persaud, Edmund McNeely, um, geez, um, Elliot. Elliot Richardson. Uh, oh, Elliot Richardson and 
Carmen. Carmen Bot. Carmen there Bot. we go. Thank you. Thank you. Brain farts. Anyway, so uh, you can, uh, Sheldon's probably the best guy to put your name in for or nominate someone who you think would be good. We're looking for rep representation across Canada if possible, not just Ontario. That's my CSCA. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm going to take the opportunity just because I can. That survey that's going out, it is admittedly clunky in places. It was to replicate some research that has been done in the NCAA on three different occasions. Um, my vision with that for the last six and a half years has been to actually get a definition of what's going on in Canada, who's doing the jobs, so that we can stop giving recommendations to people, whether uh, it's aspiring coaches, stakeholders, organizations, et cetera, based upon information from another country that's really not similar to ours at all, except they're connected by land. Like that's kind of the extent of the similarity there. Um, so I encourage, you know, people that are on here, people that are in your networks, get them to answer it so that it's actually representative of people that are doing the job in Canada um, in a performance realm rather than people that just decided to answer it. Obviously very self-serving, not going to be uh, shy about that, but I do think it's a worthwhile project. Um, so what we're gonna move into now, uh, when we were discussing topics, it, it came freshest in my mind when chatting with Colin, and that's the reason why I asked him to be on here um, a, a few weeks ago, about pivots, um, career capital. You know, What are people thinking now? Are they thinking about diversifying more? I would venture to say, I was gonna say six months ago, but this has been going on six months now. I would venture to say about a year ago, People that were in institutional type jobs, um, you know, working for PSOs, NSOs, the Sport Institute, um, governmental agencies, whether it's um, military universities, et cetera, were not worried about their career security. They were not worried about losing their jobs. They were not worried about being cut down to 10, 15%, that type of thing um, of their salaries or of their workload. But now they are, um, and now we are. So. What are ways that different people have diversified up until now? Um, and what are some different ways that we're thinking moving forward? What are some conversations that we've had with our stakeholders, administration, employers, et cetera, about our futures and, and how we can be kind of pandemic proof? Obviously, this is a very unique example. And even to the effect of, um, maybe I should, I should have looked up the exact detail of this, but a football coach in the NCAA got a new contract a couple months back and it was um, kind of groundbreaking because it was the first time that a pandemic clause was written in a sports contract. So his contract was um, dependent on the number of games that he coached. And if it was less than a certain amount then he didn't get his full pay and it actually referenced if the games were canceled due to a pandemic. Um, I know that's extreme, but what are, what are different ways that we're all thinking uh, right now? I think we're going to lead into Trev. You uh, had a little bit of an intro slideshow and, and along the way we'll call on different people we have um, Joey, Dave, Colin, Steve, uh, Jay or Jason and I noticed Mac on there as well I know that he's pivoted around a bit as well and just so that we can share ideas on how can we diversify the audience that we're showing our value to because essentially that's how we can make ourselves you know pandemic proof or recession proof or whatever it is. Over to you Trev. Good good. Need to get my screen privileges here. Give the power. While Trev's doing that, one of the interesting things is that everybody that I contacted, Dave, Steve, and Colin, were kind of like, ah, I don't know if this is me, man. Um, but they're guys that have worked either, you know, private contracts in the past and diversified um, in addition to their primary employment. There are people that started up things at universities that didn't quite have it. Um, there are people that are still doing things now and, and people that are thinking about things the situation so that's um, that's why we included some of these people instead of um, all people that you know did a full pivot into private from institutional for instance or right out of the industry yeah thanks Jordan so when we came with this topic I was just thinking okay how do we organize our thought process through it and I started thinking well what is traditional what is normal what is kind of the regular pathway um, strength conditioning, even though we've talked several times in the shop talk about people being around forever in this, in this field, it's, it's still pretty darn new in Canada. 
So it's hard to really tell uh, what the long-term prospects are for a person working in the career here. But based off my experience in the U.S. and uh, what I've seen so far in Canada, I think in general we can say we we can visualize this kind of pro progress. So what you have here is a timeline of sorts. And you can see I've actually assigned kind of approximate ages. Again, these are just uh, approximates of traditional kind of pathways we'd go through in our career. And so usually our industry, it starts with our interest in sport as youth. We've usually, most of us have achieved at certain levels in sport. And that's kind of what, what we love and what we do. And this led to usually some kind of education related to sport, although not always. So generally, though, most of us went on to either a college diploma program, fitness and health promotion, or kinesiology related or physical education related degree. And during that time, usually we got introduced uh, to strength conditioning because we didn't have a lot of strength conditioning in the high school. And as youth sport, amateur sport, we just weren't exposed to it too much. A few of us here just kind of picked it up on the fly or had an aunt or an uncle or something like that that allowed us to um, um, kind of break into it a little bit. But um, usually it was university where we got introduced to what is strength conditioning. Uh, usually there was some kind of influence from mentors. It could be faculty members. It could be an existing strength coach. And then uh, we did our time, we uh, did our volunteer hours, maybe then we got a little bit of a part-time gig and we proved our ability and such that when shortly after graduating, say 20 to 24 years old, we're able to start climbing the ladder. So I'm looking at some of the names that are here in this talk today and each of you, I, I have some imagery of how you climb the ladder, usually starting often in that university type setting and then you started, went into a part-time role Maybe you dabbled in a little bit of private, maybe you had some of your own clients on the side, you proved yourself, went into a small contract, went into a bigger contract, and then eventually got picked up in a salaried position. I'd say almost half the people on this call, that's kind of the situation. And, and a lot of you are uh, on this call are kind of in this range right now. Then what you'll find, uh, what I find is common is that once you've established yourself and you've kind of climbed that ladder and you're in that more stable position, which you've been aching for for so long, there's actually a bit of a contraction you usually go through. Uh, some of you may be um, having that come to Jesus moment where you're thinking, okay, what's next? What do I got to do? And usually this is assigned with family life as well. And maybe I'm looking forward to hearing from Steve because Steve continues to grow his role, but he probably noticed when he was in his mid thirties that he had to kind of start thinking about the family situation uh, work-life balance. He's not in the weight room 16 hours a day anymore. Uh, and, you know, you have your Jordan Foley's here as well, went on, had a kid, that kind of thing. So usually there's some kind of contraction where you start saying, all right, I got to make this real. I got to be able to uh, satisfy work-life balance. So I'm going to actually withdraw from some of that grind that I'm used to and try and be a little bit more strategic in what I'm doing. But during this whole time, you're probably looking forward to this period of time. What am I doing to set up myself for retirement? And so I'm calling that legacy position. So where do you go to next? Are you just a lead of strength and conditioning or are you looking at a director of human performance? Are you looking at um, um, you know, moving up the, the ladder within your own, let's say a, a governmental organization, whatever it may be? what's gonna to lead to you actually being able to retire? Because none of us are making huge wages. You gotta start thinking, when I retire, how much money will I have to live at the age of 65? In Canada, there's not many of these right now. There's very, very small handful. So it's hard to really understand what the long-term positions are. And so it's gonna be interesting in this conversation to hear from even Jordan yourself and Steve and uh, some of the other old timers that are on this call you know, where do you see this going? What is, is it just keep plugging and chugging until you're 65 and then um, pull out and ca you know, collect your CPP and little RESP that you've, RRSP that you've been able to save? And then I suspect, and what I've seen in the States is a lot of this. Usually what happens is you, you tune out usually more around 60 than 65, and then you just co coach a little bit on the side. I call it hobby coaching, run a little weightlifting group or something like that. Uh, give back to your grandkids, that sort of thing. But the question is then, if this is a traditional role, what if this doesn't work for anybody? Because obviously in Canada, 
it's not going to work for everybody because we don't have enough jobs, especially now with COVID, we have a retraction of the, um, the job opportunities. So at any time during these phases, you have to be able to pull that ripcord and pop out into other alternative careers. And so usually if you're in that younger uh, stage, you, you start realizing, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get a job. Then you just go into private industry. Maybe you'll set up your own contracts with um, uh, local teams or clubs or individuals. Uh, maybe you'll just go back into good old personal training and see if you can't make it tenable at a smaller or maybe a larger box or you become just your traditional kinesiologist working in a rehab environment or you just move out of the profession altogether you, you go into a new career role but once you're bought into that 32 to 45 age range and you're kind of more of a lead role if you're going to pull the ripcord um, you got to think okay am i going to move backwards in pay am i going to have to rebuild or am i going to move still in either a horizontal or a vertical fashion and so you may want to uh, consider uh, working in private as well. It's not uncommon that people move into private from there or going into a professional consultant. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about people like Derek Hansen. And uh, I have another friend, Joey Eisenman, who went that route, um, just consulting for a living. Uh, maybe you'll start working in sales. So some people have moved to push bands and catapults and Sparta performance and uh, you name you name all the different technologies that are out there, team builders, or maybe you'll start you'll just create your own little boutique business. But a lot of people may find themselves thinking about going this route. Either go, teaching is a, a common aspiration, you know, giving back through teaching, or moving into more traditional governmental roles. So maybe working in municipal parts and rec, or even uh, I would I would group military into this as well. But as you go on and you get to that 45 to 65 age group, then you're, you're really uh, risking when you pull out um, going backwards. And that's a problem because you're about to retire here. So again, you can do private consulting, but now you got to start thinking, okay, can I move into bigger business? Can I lead business? Again, you got to start thinking, can I lead in government? Uh, will I make enough in sales to move there? So what the theme of this lecture today is, how do you build your career capital for each of these stages so that you can pull that ripcord and actually fall into some of these positions and you don't move backwards. So, you know, usually early on, we just talked about certifications, um, you know, within strength conditioning or maybe other sport NCCP type certifications, or what's most common is people go and get a master's or sometimes even PhD. But once you're in your 32 to 45, that's a little less likely unless you're like Steve or Dave here who just, they like going to school all the time. Uh, it's not as likely as you're going to go back to school uh, a little bit harder with family. So, you know, how can you move into the next stage? So maybe that's when you start doing some teaching at a variety of different levels, maybe at college uh, sort of thing, or even high school, maybe. Um, you get more involved in professional associations, of course, CSCA, but the NSCA, you get your name out there. You start publishing uh, articles, actually doing research teaming up with uh, universities to do research so your name gets on publications, uh, getting specialized areas of expertise through publication. You go on the conference circuit and um, you start actually leading and managing and understanding how to develop a strategic plan and how to read a profit and loss statement and all that kind of stuff. And that's the kind of things you want to be thinking about at this age group. And then as you go into this more legacy area, you got to be a little bit more peak, uh, picky about um, your career building opportunities because really you're if you really want to move into a vertical fashion you must think that business side of thing you know can you build new buildings can you develop new programs can you create strategic plans can you lead groups can you manage and then supplement that with uh, a known area of expertise that people recognize you through publishing uh, this could be online presence or it could be um, actual research publication or just uh, lay journals uh, writing a books, that kind of thing, and promoting all that in the conference circuit. So that's kind of the intro I wanted to give for people to think through, all right, where am I on that continuum? And how do I career proof um, my position uh, based off where I am? And so I think Jordan's going to take it back now. He's going to go through a few different stories of some of the uh, people who are joining us here. Some are from private, some have gone public back to private. And then we're going to get uh, advice from a variety of different people who have had to shift 
um, their focus and move from one area to another. So back to you, Jordan. Okay, I'm gonna try to keep it fairly brief. As far as the um, three people that I'll call on first, um, we'll go with, we'll just go Dave, Dave first, um, then Steve, if he's still on the line, and, and then Colin. Quite simply, stealing a concept from um, the CEO Strength Coach book by Ron McKeefrey, he talks about having a balance in your career progression between being a technician, into a manager and being an entrepreneur. So for Dave, Steve, and Colin, what are ways that you've um, tried to build up your career capital in at different points during your career and the balance between being a technician, doing some management and entrepreneurial pursuits? Um, yeah, that was a good book, by the way. Um, I, I guess... Myself personally, like I started off in sort of that private sector. So I sort of built my way up from being, um, I don't know, a part-time sort of coach that just comes in and, and shadows people to, by the time I was finished <clears throat> in the private space where I was at, I was actually sort of the manager of the space. So I was in charge of sort of managing interns and, and people and stuff. So from a managerial role, that was always sort of something that, I guess I was lucky enough to get some experience in from that role. Um, in terms of the technician, just continuing to take on professional development opportunities, um, continuing to talk to like-minded coaches, go to courses, read books, that sort, that sort of thing. And then from an entrepreneurial side of things, um, I've always had a handful of sort of online clients that I've kind of hung on to a little bit. Um, just train on the side, make a little bit of extra kind of money that I would put towards sort of some of my education and pieces like that and sort of running it as um, my own business. And then I've used those skills that I developed that way to be more a word that's not used very often, but entrepreneurial and then bringing those skills to places that I've been at, whether that's been helping out with some of the social media aspects of things, um, helping kind of create new programs at places so you can, you can use those outside skills to sort of um, enhance places where you do work and, and provide extra value that way. Dave, before we move on to Steve, um, just because I know a little bit about the specific situation and obviously only, only share personally where you're comfortable, but you know, you worked at SST before um, and, and you talked vaguely about some of those skills and things that you gathered there. How did you use those and actually maybe Steve will answer here in a minute on your behalf, but how did you use those to show value for then an institutional environment um, from a specific sense? So like how, how did you show more value than if you're going up against candidates that did not have that private experience? Um, that was a bit of a tough jump personally, but um, once I kind of got into it a little bit more, it seemed to be a bit easier, but I, I guess, one of the initial places that I was able to kind of help out was if you know anything about our model, we have a huge private side of things. So we would bring in, or we still bring in um, like triple A hockey, triple A hockey teams and, and club volleyballs and things like that. So right away in that side of things, I felt right at home. So um, we had a lot of initial meetings on pricing structures and, and pieces like that. And I felt that I was able to offer, um, good insight there and, and help some of those pieces kind of fall into place and, and hit the ground running a little bit with that. Obviously, um, we were sort of transplanting a model for, that had worked already at another place, but we had some opportunities to, to grow on that and work on that. Um, and then just, I think one of the other unique experiences that I had was we have to write or in the, in the position I was in, I was writing upwards of, I don't know, 15, 20, 25 programs a week. Um, just because of the nature of the business model, it was a lot of different sort of things going on. So um, being able to sort of bring some of those skills to our educational piece for some of our students, um, I think has been really kind of clutch. Steve, are you here on the line somewhere? I am on the line. Wicked. 
And Steve, one of the things that I'd love to hear about from you is, um, put simply, like you're always a guy that's been doing everything. Um, and what was your kind of line of thinking and how do you think it's paid off for you if you do think that it's paid off as far as uh, different national team contracts, hosting camps, um, full-time employment at York, McMaster, Brock, a um, little bit of teaching here and there, private courses, any of that type of stuff or anything else do you think is um, relevant? Yeah, I don't know. I, it, it's it's interesting for me because I, I worked the entire time I was doing my undergrad uh, and even my uh, when I did my uh, my diploma in, in fitness and lifestyle as well, when I did those two prior to being full-time employed at the university, I was in the private model. I was working in posh clubs downtown Toronto, uh, Young and Davisville area, and that's where we used to live. And I, I just I felt um, as though I was constantly applying what I was learning, and I thought that was probably the biggest key. Um, along the way, um, like Trev mentioned, volunteering and volunteering. So when I, I went back to York to do my, my undergrad in Kin and, and uh, you know, study from Tudor Bonfa in undergrad and Charlie Francis at the track, and you're sitting there with these now people who are constantly referenced. You didn't realize how good you had it, but, um, you know, when you're, when you're learning from people like that, um, but all the while volunteering with varsity teams, like our, at York, our basketball teams didn't have strength coach, so I started working with them. Um, and then, uh, you know, it, it's, it's putting in that time. It was exhausting. I was doing my undergrad. I was working full time at clubs and gyms and I was, uh, you know, training these teams and going to games and such, and then almost acting like a, almost a full-time strength coach. Um, you know, it was, it was interesting. It was exhausting, but at the same time, if I hadn't done it, I, it wouldn't have opened the doors uh, that it did open because when I graduated after studying Ken and AT, um, you know, I got a, a, a pretty sharp nudge from Rosie Posca, who was uh, the director at York at the time. And she just said, look, we're putting together a position for a first full-time transition coach, uh, and we really want you to apply for it. And I, I had already been accepted to Teachers College. So long story short, I had to decline Teachers College, apply, uh, and, and got it. And, and it was all, I think, mainly because just the athletes knew who I was. They knew what I could bring to the table. They knew high passion. And that's kind of how it, it all worked out. But I'd say that was the big one. When, when we talk about technician, I was really fortunate to be involved with Hockey Canada right away. Um, you know, I was hired in 04. By 05, I was flying out to Calgary and, and, and meeting with the Jason Pools and uh, Matt Jordans of the world and, and just literally soaking in the national team training environment at um, University of Calgary uh, in the Olympic Oval and just seeing how speed skating and luge and bobsled and hockey were all training and that was a huge exposure moment for me because I, I, it really helped me understand the value of Olympic weightlifting, speed development, uh, and, and just, you know, picking these guys' brains as to where do I do these courses when I get home. And it was a, it was a steep learning curve, uh, but that learning curve was, was necessary. And then I, I, I really didn't say a lot at my first camp. I just took it all in, worked my butt off, and I, I guess I, I uh, you know, left the mark on someone because they brought me back for another camp and then another camp and then, you know, slowly got a chance to start working with teams and, and uh, you know, um, it was just interesting. So technician wise, I was really fortunate to be involved with Hockey Canada when we're, when they were developing their um, regional pools of transition coaches and bringing us in to be educated by Steve Norris or Doc Smith on just the periodization of training. Um, and so that was big for me uh, as far as a technician standpoint goes and, and still big for me because I, I got to meet a lot of really great people, therapists, doctors that just helped open doors for me as I went and acted as my references when I applied to McMaster or, or other locations. Um, and so those were the big ones, but the whole time the entrepreneurial piece was big for me from uh, the contacts that I'd made at York university, uh, Darren McConaughey and, and Sean Jeffers. Sean ended up getting hired by TFC and, and, and Darren um, with uh, the Hamilton Bulldogs slash Montreal Canadiens. And the three of us went together and, and entrepreneurially put together a, a company that you wouldn't even know about, but called Propulsion. Uh, this was a company that, um, you know, in 2007, eight, nine, uh, we had filmed over 7,000 rehab and training exercises, put together something similar to what you would see in Team Builder and Train Heroic. We sold it to numerous NHL teams um, and then started, um, you know, just putting together, um, well, I think well ahead of its time, web-based training we hired a web designer um, software technician a guy that could take excel programming and make it similar to what you would see in team builder and trainer so that 
I mean, I can, I think those are the main things. I think all the while just constantly going to different courses in both therapy and training and, and hosting courses and, you know, and, and, and just trying to develop skill sets and areas that were niche amongst uh, strength and inching that now has become commonplace. So Olympic weightlifting, hosting Trevor, uh, Trevor uh, Cottrell and, and Jay McLean came to, you know, McMaster to do present uh, presentation for our staff there. And I don't know. I, I think the one thing I would say is the whole time, never being satisfied with knowing enough, <laughs> like just being humble and learning and learning and learning was probably the biggest piece for me. Um, and then the second piece was just surrounding yourself with people that are better than you and everything. So you know, hiring Dave McDowell was a no-brainer for me. I mean, he came in and, uh, you know, and Jordan would attest to this. I, I was between two people to hire uh, for Dave's position at Brock. Um, and it really um, came down to, uh, you know, two questions that were posed. Who, who could win us a national championship? And when Dave, when I opened up Dave's programming, it was so much more crisp due to his expertise in Excel. Uh, he was showing sessional RPEs after each session. He was showing just a, a periodization approach that the other candidates weren't. And then obviously Jordan gave him a big uh, thumbs up, which helped. And then, uh, you know, those would be the, probably the bigger things that Dave brought right away. He's right. He brought that, that private side, the programming, the periodization. And I knew right away if, if we're going to win a national title or start to win OUA medals and things like that, uh, you know, that Dave was the right uh, strength coach. So if I could slip in a question, Steve, you've mentored a ton of people. A lot of them want to be strength coaches. A lot of them don't end up being strength coaches. What is the advice you give to them? Because I know you do a lot of work workshops and education. And how do you guide them in one direction or the other? Good question, Trev. Um, really good question. Um, when I mentor students, I'm, it's interesting. You know, I remember being at OUA strength coach conference a, a long time ago, maybe in 07, 08. And, you know, a lot of questions were coming up, like, how do I get interns? And, like, how can I get them to do my work? And, and I really quickly stopped. I, I remember who it was. I, I'll go and mention, but I stopped them. They were a young strength coach. And I said, y your goal isn't to have someone do your work. Your goal is to develop them as someone better than you're going to be. Um, and, and I think that's the biggest piece is, number one, investing in people and developing them is, is – is, uh, I don't know, some people call it selfless, I guess. It's, it's something where it takes a heck of a lot of energy and time, but, you know, the, the benefits are a legacy um, far beyond your reach. And, and, and uh, I would say the biggest thing is meeting with them. I, I meet with each of my students that I, I mentor twice a year, December and April, um, and it's 15, 20 minute check-ins, but you wouldn't believe how, long, how far those go. I get a chance to really get to know, all right, you're in your third year, your second year, you know, where is your passion leading to you? What, who can I set up a meeting with for you so that you can go and shadow a, you know, if it's a physiologist, if it's a physician, if it's a, you know, a chiropractor, an osteopath, a strength coach, whatever, who do you want to meet with? How can we make that happen? And then when you do those things and you open doors for them, it's much more rewarding almost than any undergraduate experience they have because it's someone actually listening and talking to them um, and, and, and giving career advice. And it's not long, but it's, it's long enough where I think we leave a lasting impact on people. And I think that's, that's probably the biggest thing is just investing in, in young people, giving them direction, uh, but also listening to them and letting their passions guide where they go, not me telling them where to go, if that makes sense. Thanks, Steve. Before I transition to Colin, quick, one of the things that I want to bring up, because when Sam, uh, Trevor, and I were kind of bringing this idea um, or refining this idea before we pushed it out, one of the things that I was very big on and, and we're very big on is these are people that are good coaches. Um, it's not like, how did you market yourself to make money? And that's come through so much in just the first two guys that have talked so far, as far as um, they spent so much time talking about the technical piece and then they just saw opportunities to offer more of that technical piece to other people. Um, so I, I think that's important because uh, that's, that's a lot of where we come from instead of the other angle of things, not, not downplaying that angle, but it's just not something I've really been involved in and I don't know much about. Um, so Colin, if you're still there, I don't see you on my screen. Uh, you can just talk about one of the things, Colin, that I, I wanted you to chat about was, and I might have this wrong, but you were living in Windsor, largely working private, 
And then, you, you know, you work with some of the teams at the university and how did that even happen? Because I think that that is a skill that a lot of us don't talk about and, and don't, um, don't mentor our young staff on. Like it's easy to train the teams that are in front of you. Uh, you know, you work at, I'm just going to use Guelph because Josh is on my screen there right now. Like you work at Guelph, the Guelph athletes throw up, throw up, show up. You, you have the Guelph facility, like it's easy enough, but how do you get to the stage of people don't even know the value of training to you being the person that's sitting at the table with their coach, developing a performance plan and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for including me on this too. Um, yeah, for, for me, my kind of backstory is I started in personal training and then uh, I, that, this is a, makes me sound really dumb, but I didn't really know in my fourth year of university what the difference between a master's degree and a graduate program was. I thought they were two very different things and pretty much the same thing. Like nobody, I had no aspirations of doing another degree. I had no aspirations of taking the next step. I just remember doing CanFit Pro to be a personal trainer so I could improve my reservation or improve my resume to get me to be a PT. So, um, but then it just led one thing led to another. I ended up going back to graduate school a couple of years later. Um, and I was still personal training at the time, but, um, for me, all of my opportunities and, and I, I know everybody knows this is true, but we don't always like to admit it. All of my opportunities came from a recommendation off of somebody else. So, um, every step of the way, and I have two clear stories of that. And when I started at the University of Windsor, I was a personal trainer at the time. My only athlete I had ever coached by that point was like 14 years old. Um, and he was just like played like rec soccer or something like that. Uh, but at that point, I was starting my graduate degree. A girl I was doing my graduate degree with used to play volleyball. She no longer had the time to – she consulted with our women's volleyball team at the time. So she's like, oh, I think I'm going to give it up. And I just said, can you introduce me? I wouldn't mind talking to him three or four years later down the road, I'm then coaching football as well as the head strength and conditioning coach. And then taking on volleyball and doing some stuff on like uh, some programming stuff for their hockey teams. Point being is I applied to this Queens job uh, 2014. I think in January of 2014, this job was posted. Some of you interviewed for that job um, and somebody else was hired. So in that time period, um, I submitted a resume and a cover letter, fresh out of graduate school, a few years under my belt of strength and conditioning, managing everything, making a million mistakes, but also making a million connections. So I, I, I sent um, my resume and my cover letter to that job. I didn't get an email back that it had been received. I didn't get a request for an interview. I got nothing. Uh, in the next basically eight months, I went and visited with, uh, I went to the East West Bowl, which was in um, a University of Western and, and uh, Jeff um, was, was running out of University of Western. So we, uh, um, Jeff Watson, that is, sorry. But he was running at the University of Western. He took me out for lunch because I told him because I was coming up to watch some of my athletes participate. And he spent the entire day with me and showed me everything in his facility, how everything runs, how he sets up and takes things down, his programming. He spent everything, showed me all the equipment that he had made from, hand, from scratch. Um, and he turned out to have been on that interview panel in that January time period of the job that I wanted and didn't get. Long story short, down the road in August, Queens hires again because that, that strength coach uh, ended up leaving strength and conditioning for that period of time. Um, I submitted the exact same resume. I submitted the exact same cover letter, but maybe with a few minor adjustments. Um, but the biggest difference was I had missed out on another job opportunity at, uh, at another school. And my, the head coaches that I work for from football and volleyball has said to me, uh, you need to start using us as your references. Like you're, you don't ask us for anything. You just put your head down and keep working. And you've never asked us as, to like call anybody on your behalf. So either like next time you apply to a job, let us know. And then what was funny is I ended up getting the job at Queens. I didn't even know uh, I was getting it until the, I was coaching women's volleyball. The head coach came out of his office at 7.30 in the morning after I was finishing my session with them. And he's like, hey, you're going to get that job in about 30 minutes. So how, it was just crazy. And it was the exact same, like I said, job application and everything. I just simply asked a couple of people to reach out for me. But I like to do, think I am technically sound and I, I'm, I'm maybe not the greatest strategic coach, but I've had my success in my career based on, hopefully I'm not overstepping here and saying anything out of the ordinary, but I like to think I'm a good person and I like to think I treat people with respect and I prioritize my athletes and I, 
I try to create relationships with them. I've been at Queens now. This is my seventh season. I've never had an, uh, an athletic director. They're super busy. I've never had these people, high performance director. They never watch your sessions. They never evaluate how you coach. Very rarely do you have interaction with certain administrators. And that's not a knock. It's just the busy lifestyle of it all. But the point being is the biggest thing I get judged off of isn't my technical and tactical ability with strength and conditioning and working with coaches. It's do the coaches enjoy working with me? Is there a mutual respect there? And do the athletes report me well at my, their questionnaires at the end of the year? And do I create an inclusive and fun and competitive environment? So um, that's what I've been able to build our success off of. And obviously we teach our interns all of the, the technical aspects of it as well. But if there's anything I can pass down to them is like, one, when you're young, you say no, say no to like, sorry, say yes to everything, say no to nothing. You always say yes, you take on more. Um, I was able to work in strength and conditioning with those two teams when I was doing my graduate degree while managing a full client load, while going to school full time. Um, it was a crazy time, but I was the first person in my class to finish their master's degree. I finished it in 18 months. So I was able to manage time, manage and learn through that experience to be able to set myself up for success later, but made a million mistakes along the way. So just keep saying yes, even though you're getting busy. But now I'm at the point in my career, which is in line with what Trev was kind of posting is now I'm 32 years old. And for the first time I'm having to say no, because I'm trying to make decisions so I can now stay married and, and stay, <laughs> uh, have a house over my head and, and make sure I can enjoy the, the fruits of the labor. But for me, a lot of the, my success has been built off of the relationships we've been able to build. Thanks, buddy. I mean, I mostly heard Ford. I don't know what you heard that Colin thinks he's better than us. What? Uh... <laughs> no, 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 no. If I was on that interview panel, I was not on the interview panel of all you guys. That's what I'm saying. Like, I had no business getting the job when I got it. To be honest, I was in over my head. I'm sure all of us can agree <laughs> there. But uh, it's crazy when I look at the lineup of people that I'd interviewed in the previous January. Yeah, I got very, very lucky, but I'm very grateful for it. And now to call you guys colleagues is a, is a whole nother level of gratitude. Um, thanks for that, man. Right now, what we're going to do is call on Jay Mojado and Audible. I'm going to ask him is Mac James, um, a couple guys that – and you guys can clear up the facts if I get some or all of it wrong. Um, <laughs> that had institutional jobs, you know, at colleges, universities, um, that, got asked, that got asked during this time. And, you know, what those guys were, were thinking at the time, how they decided to uh, put their head down and move forward to continue to be in this line of work. So we'll start off with you, Jay. I see you're off. Uh, and then um, after that, just so that we're, we're not forgetting them. And Joey, I don't know a ton about you, to be honest, but um, you're a guy, I see your info out there online. I don't have Instagram, so I only see whatever you use. Some fancy app to get it on Facebook as well, but a guy that has a really good um, athletic history and, and is doing some good coaching uh, as far as what are some recommendations probably for all of us on how to survive out there and uh, make a living for yourself while doing good coaching instead of, honestly like the kind of bullshit like run 12 people through for 12 bucks an hour and this type of thing so um we'll have jay mac and, and then joey about how he's built up a career for himself kind of in the west gta type area doing performance coaching over to you jay awesome i uh, appreciate it um no jordan got uh, got the facts right um you know when we talked a few months ago when all this was happening um I was at St. Lawrence College. I'd been there for two years um, after spending the last uh, eight before that in, in the OCAA, so at Humber and at Seneca. Um, and so, yeah, our, our administration, um, you know, didn't renew our contracts at that time um, with a, the, the, you know, the directive was maybe in January. Well, obviously sport uh, got canceled, so that probably wouldn't happen anyway. Um, <clears throat> heading into that, I was already, as Trevor said, looking at, you know, not necessarily the next step, but um, what else can I do? I, I've kind of been in the field for 15 years and, and kind of have specialized within within basketball for the last five or six. And so, you know, how do I start to leverage some of those things, whether that's relationships or, or expertise uh, in other areas, right? And so um, I was working on a, on a coaching course for basketball coaches around uh, warm-ups and, and how to kind of um, warm up um, kind of specifically for the sport of basketball or, or some things to look at. And so I was looking at that before 
COVID happened, as far as a live event, um, once our school year was over. Um, and so, you know, I lost my job and, and, and that became a, a, a greater focus was that coach education and, and still running that course. So we did it virtually um, a few weeks ago and, and it was awesome and, and leveraged a lot of coaches, basketball coaches and skill trainers that I had met over the last few years. Um, and so that was great. That was just something, you know, I, I kind of found a need and was like, you know, these warmups are terrible, but, you know, we're just doing soccer warmups for basketball. Like there's got to be a right away. And, and something that I'll kind of continue to add pieces around. Um, so that was something, you know, that we'll do a live event once we can. And, and that coach education piece was a big part. Um, and then the other thing that I did over the pandemic was a mentorship program. And so I, you know, I, I like a lot of people here, you feel a lot of the same questions from, from young coaches or with Instagram, people are, you know, reaching out or DMing, Oh, how did you get to where you are? Or, or what are some things like we're talking about today? And so, um, after talking to some mentors, I, I was like, they're like, why don't you have a, a mentorship, like a five week kind of short mentorship? And I was like, yeah, why don't I? I don't know why. Uh, imposter syndrome is why. Uh, that's the answer to that question. And so, um, you know, I didn't market it much, just kind of did some stuff on Instagram, reached out to people I already knew who were asking me questions. And we ran a five week virtual mentorship program. Um, for young coaches, that was the focus, um, giving them some technical uh, things to think about um, that maybe you don't learn in school um, talking about kind of how to build your brand um, and that, you know, that's not a dirty word and, and, and that, you know, having a brand or, or using, you know, Instagram or, or different channels to promote yourself is not, you know, a, a dirty word and, and things like that. And so we worked through that and that was awesome. Um, feedback was really great and working with a colleague on an advanced kind of version of that for, for coaches who are kind of taking a, another step. Um, and so that was really fun. Um, just kind of collaborating and putting that together. Um, and like other people have said in the call is like, you don't really know who's watching. Right. And so you're always kind of doing your stuff and, and you don't really know who's watching. And now those coaches who maybe, you know, saw you across the core in my case, doing a warm up or the same ones that, are now reaching out to you about, you know, bringing that to you. And, and one of the great things about being in the, in the private sector and not being kind of tied to a school is that I can work with anybody. And so I'm doing virtual consulting with, with UPI's men's basketball program. I know the coach there. And, and now I can say yes to that question or say yes to that conversation where when I'm working at another school, I couldn't, or I'd, you know, they couldn't compete. Like I worked at McMaster at the same time I worked at Humber College and, and we didn't, you know, Steve was, was great ab about not seeing conflict there and, and allowing me to do that. And, but some, some schools are not. And so um, now I can say yes to, to these coaches who are asking me for, maybe it's a presentation about a certain area for their staff or, um, or consulting with the team throughout the whole year of which I'm doing with UPI now. So um, that's kind of where I'm at. I am now. I'm working working in the private sector uh, um, in a in a private gym in Guelph. Um, but still, again, that private side gives me the flexibility, like Max is going to talk and like Jory's going to talk about, um, to do these other things in college and, and youth sport. Like, there's no there's not a lot of time. Like, you can't. And when I was dealing with six teams or ten teams or twelve, like there's no time to do these other things that maybe you really would love to do. Right. And you have to wait until the summer or you have to wait until kind of these down periods. And now I can kind of, you know, sort my schedule around it and be able to, to do some of these other things. So that's just kind of, kind of where I'm at. Um, you know, ran a couple of programs over the quarantine, uh, over the pandemic that went really well and, and looking forward to building on that um, as we get out of this, but also kind of just in addition to it. Thanks, buddy. Um, well, Max, you could jump in here and um, kind of talk about what you've been up to and, and what things you're thinking about for the future. Okay, cool. Uh, just mic check. You can hear me, right? Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, so similar situation as Jay. It's funny because we've sat down and talked about what we were doing, what we kind of wanted to do. Um, so I was at Guelph with Josh, uh, got cut about a year away from 
being full time. Um, I took some time to just kind of evaluate what I wanted to do with everything and um, did some online education and and stuff like watching conferences and then I just started training people because I wanted to keep myself fresh and help some people out at the start of quarantine. I was literally charging like 25 bucks a session just out of the goodness of my heart I guess but um, then I figured like I got to start making some money like my mortgage was deferred at the time but um, one of the biggest things that I took from it was I just needed to slow down like collegiate coaching as most of us know is kind of like really fast paced go 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 all the time until exams hit and then kids go home and it's time to plan for the summer and summer's go 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 so it's kind of nice to just put the brakes on kind of reevaluate like what's really important in generally your entire life um, outside of coaching and sport um, and then I just started slowly getting into training people it started evolving with what COVID uh, protocols were coming out at the time so it was online mostly I signed up for train heroic uh, started making programs on there for people virtually um, doing zoom sessions I still do zoom sessions with people I got guy in Markham I got um, a couple of people in Guelph that still just want to do online stuff um, then I started going to parks doing speed work I take some med balls um, bands and stuff change of direction doing stuff in parks. And then I started looking for places to go and train once uh, phase two kind of got a little bit lighter. And I found this baseball performance place. I was in between a couple gyms that I wanted to rent space, just kind of as like a private entity. So I didn't really have to answer to anybody and I can make my own schedule. Um, and this baseball performance place in Guelph, they, uh, they have like six kind of bullpens that they train kids and sunny <laughs> pros uh, in and it, that was a place for me my body works in the back as a chiropractor who also works at the place uh, Jay uh, works at as well um, it was a good place for referrals to kind of build up a client base but I didn't want to pigeonhole myself so I kind of said uh, do athletes I've been doing general population trying to get some parents involved I'm doing kind of like an open session Saturday mornings where people can sign up if they message me and kind of hold their spot um, just to introduce them to my style of training. So um, I'm not seen as just the athletic trainer guy that some people think that strength coaches are. Um, so I'm not, I'm not really trying to pigeonhole myself as just like a baseball performance coach now. Like I do have a lot more baseball players coming in, but I'm going to be starting to train like a professional boxer that, that is training here in Guelph because I just started doing boxing training myself. Just wanted to be coached by somebody else and learn a new skill. Um, so yeah, I'm, I have my hand kind of in everything. I'm just looking to the horizon, to see what I can do next. I saw Josh yesterday and I was literally like, we were talking about opening up um, a part-time brewery, part-time coffee shop, and maybe have like a weight room on the side, who knows? because um, we don't know how long this stuff's going to last. I just wanted to have something in my back pocket um, just in case I didn't get my collegiate job back or there wasn't a collegiate job anywhere to go back to. Um, so this is just kind of my, my options right now. And it's kind of nice. It was kind of nice to slow down. It's kind of nice to set your own schedule. And I'm being offered mostly evening hours at this gym, but I can kind of fill it how I want and take the days off that I need to. Um, but it would be nice to get back to something consistent, but it is what it is right now. Cool, buddy. Thanks for that. Sweater's looking fresh, by the way. Whatever detergent you're using, keep it up. Um, <laughs> Joey, Joey, if you could jump in and just talk about, um, you know, how you built your business up, how that evolved a little bit through COVID, and then for someone that, you know, has that um, thriving full private business and has been doing it for a little bit. Uh, what's some advice for, for the rest of us? Hey guys. Um, yeah. Thanks for having me on the call. Um, basically yeah, I've been in business now for a couple of years. I have a, I own a business called Excel performance training. Um, 
uh, as Jordan kind of alluded to, um, spent a lot of my uh, young life in uh, um, high level athletics. I uh, played football McMaster uh, through my time there and then afterwards ended up going on to the sport of bobsleigh. And uh, so I competed in bobsleigh for uh, about six years. And uh, basically um, I've been working as a strength coach uh, for about a decade now um, and was mostly working in uh, private facilities. Um, I actually worked with, uh, with Dave um, at SST uh, back in the day. Um, so connection there. And um, yeah, so, you know, generally during, uh, during off seasons and whatnot, I would kind of come back and I'd be working with various athletes, teams, running classes, all kinds of things. And um, it was a great experience uh, through my time there to get exposed to uh, many different types of athletes at many different levels, um, all the way from, you know, nine-year-olds all the way up till, you know, professional athletes. Um, and then also just regular clients just trying to lose weight. And um, so I got kind of a glimpse of the, the private side uh, from there. Um, after, uh, after 2018, um, so I came back from the Olympics and uh, it was kind of looking for, you know, my, my next step, my next uh, job, I guess. And so um, I ended up through a connection getting um, in contact with somebody who owned a facility in Oakville called uh, Meraki, uh, Meraki Fitness and Sports Performance. And uh, basically they, they said that, oh, well, they're looking for um, some male trainers uh, to work out of there. Basically they kind of uh, like a studio. So you work as an independent contractor and you know, kind of run your business out of there. So, um, so it sounded kind of intriguing. I went and I, I talked with the owner there and uh, it sounded like a really, uh, you know, a really great opportunity. Um, the idea for me of being able to kind of create something of my own and develop my own programs um, and, you know, create my own schedule and, um, and all that was, uh, was very intriguing. So I decided to kind of, to, to go that route. Um, you know, as someone who didn't have any business education or business background, it was certainly, um, a little intimidating kind of venturing out into that, that side of things. But, um, the nice thing is that with, uh, so the owner at, at Meraki Lindsay is that she's, she was extremely supportive and she was, uh, kind of served as a, as a business mentor for me. Um, so I think that's something I for sure recommend for any coaches that are maybe looking at the private side of things to uh, find somebody who has been um, involved on the business side of things. She used to be, basically she started up her gym. She used to be a, a regional manager at a, a number of uh, good lives. And um, so she really has a good understanding of kind of the, you know, has the business mind and the fitness um, aspect as well. Um, so she was really able to help me kind of take my baby steps into, into business and, um, understand how to kind of market myself and, um, and more than anything to have confidence in, in the value that I bring to the table. I think um, it's a common thing for a lot of coaches um, in our industry to undervalue um, ourselves and they not think that what we do is anything special. Um, but what she was able to do for me was really make me see that, you know, honestly, with the skills that you bring to the table, you're bringing a lot and you deserve to be, you know, deserve to be compensated and valued, valued for that essentially. Um, and so thing, you know, things started off very small for me. I mean, I, I, the biggest thing I'd say, I mean, a lot, it's been repeated a lot already in the, in the talk is, uh, I leveraged a lot of the connections that I, I made through, um, you know, through my time as, through my time as an athlete, actually. I mean, the one thing about being a high level athlete for as long as I have is like, you get, uh, you get dinged up and banged up a lot. So you end up meeting a lot of physiotherapists and chiros and other professionals outside of that and then all of a sudden you say hey like I'm, I'm I'm in business now and I'm you know obviously looking for for athletes and whatnot to train and so you start getting kind of referrals and everything from uh from them and um you know at the, at the end of the day like uh, I think like Colin had mentioned earlier is that like over time um really like most of my my clientele that I have today uh has been off of referrals and recommendations um I truly believe that it's, you know, that if you, if you treat the people well that you're working with and you strive uh, and do your, strive to do your best to, uh, to make them better, um, that, that will, that, that, that will pay, that'll pay you back um, in the long run, because I've had a number of opportunities that have opened up um, and, you know, athletes that have been recommended my way through clients that I've, you know, that I've trained, um, you know, building positive relationships uh, with the people you work with, the people um, you know, with other connections is, is obviously a, a, a strong force, 
um, for, for growing your business and making it uh, resilient. Um, you know, many, you know, I'm happy to say like, I, I've only been in business a couple of years, but um, I feel like the majority of the clients that I have today are, a lot of them are people that started out with me from the beginning and, you know, or are people that have been with, you know, training with me for over a year now. Um, so that's, you know, a point of pride for me. I feel like I've done a good job of, you know, keeping the, building those relationships and uh, doing my best for them. Um, obviously, another part of it has just been trying to uh, put myself out there and, uh, you know, do some, go to my comfort zone a little bit. Um, I've run a number of different uh, workshops. Um, basically, o over time, I started to kind of really think about like, okay, what, what do I, uh, through my experience, especially as an athlete, what do I really bring to the table as a coach? Um, for me, uh, really the speed aspect of things was something that I was coached heavily on through my time as an athlete and something that I have a lot of experience. I had a lot of experience also coaching uh, in my time at SST. And um, so I, I really started and I, and in the environment, kind of in, in Southern Ontario in general, I, I didn't really, I felt like there was a, there was an opportunity there where I didn't see, there weren't many professionals that I knew of that were doing kind of specifically focusing on on high quality speed training. So I thought, well, this would be a really good place for me to kind of, you know, make my, my, my niche or area of expertise. So I've really over time tried to tailor my messaging uh, towards that, you know, especially via social media, for instance, um, trying to kind of um, make myself into like a, a you know, kind of like being known as the speed guy, I guess. Um, and so I've, I've run a number of different workshops just to kind of get, get myself out there and get people uh, bring people in and um, you know that that's led to other opportunities um, even like the first workshop that I ran I ran a speed I call it a speed combine up in Guelph uh, for football players kind of using my football background um, and that's actually where I ended up I met Trevor uh, for the first time he brought uh, he brought Ben out to that and um, you know I guess I I guess I did a decent job about it because he, he kept talking to me after so <laughs> he reached out and um you know, like, like what he saw, like what, like what I was trying to do there. Um, and uh, ultimately we ended up doing um, part of his Ontario education series. Sort of, we did a, a speed course together and then that's led to other opportunities, including this past, um, yeah, the past winter um, where he put me in touch with Sam Isles and I worked with a couple of your football players getting ready for the uh, CFL combine. Um, so really, yeah, just networking and, uh, you know, putting myself out there in different opportunities and, uh, you know, has really led to a, a number of different things. Um, obviously, yes, then, you know, COVID hit and uh, that kind of, you know, decimated my business. I mean, especially one that um, is kind of predicated on in-person, uh, you know, in-person training. Uh, it took a big hit initially, but, uh, you know, forced me to, 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 uh, to adapt and investigate what was out there in terms of online uh, online options. So I was able to transfer some of my clients over to, um, you know, online training platforms and also try my hand at virtual training, uh, which I was skeptical at first and even some of my clients were, but, um, you know, they, after trying it, they actually got on board and, and now that's actually, um, helped me, um, in terms of, I've had a couple clients now that have gone away for extended periods and, now all of a sudden that's an option that's available to us. Whereas before maybe they would have just been like, okay, well, you know, I'll see you whenever I get back. Um, you know, they're fully on board with the virtual training. So we're able to continue that now, um, even while they're away. Um, definitely once things were able to open again, um, after the spring, um, I immediately got outside. So I'm very fortunate that my old high school is just right behind me. Um, and so, uh, you know, started taking kids out to the track, uh, to sprint and run. And, uh, you know, I say more than anything during this time, the uh, biggest thing I've been trying to do with everybody is just to be as flexible as possible. These are, these are tricky times to navigate and different people have different levels of comfort and feelings about what's going on and everything. So I've just tried to provide as many options as possible to my clientele, really just, really just be there for them say, Hey, listen, like I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm here to help you. Like, let me know how you, how I can help you during this time. For some people, they don't feel like going back. They don't feel comfortable going into a gym. Um, so maybe we're doing more of the, the online stuff or the virtual, some of them, you know, maybe we still want to do in person. They don't want to go in the gym. Okay. So we're going, we're going to the track, right? I got weights. I got pretty much an entire gym in my car. So we'll go out there and lift weights and sprint outside. Um, whereas other people, yeah, like they want, they're anxious to get back into the gym. So, uh, so we've done that. So, uh, you know, during this time, it's just been 
really trying to, I guess, listen, listen to my clientele, listen to what their, their needs are and hear them and try to provide them different options, um, kind of in this, in these challenging times. So, so Joey, a uh, few things that come up, like we keep talking about knowing our value and, um, knowing what to charge. And uh, that's always tricky for us. We've talked about that a bit, but what I want to know from you is what things are you willing to take a loss on in order to ensure a gain downstream? So for example, that football workshop you did, I'm sure you hardly made a penny off that, right? The one yeah. where I met you, you probably, it was barely break even, right? So how did you decide what things you'll take a loss on in order to make net gain? Yeah, I definitely, uh, I definitely, I think I lost money on that one. And there was another workshop that I had that I also lost money on. But um, I think definitely those uh, kind of those like one day workshops and things like that were things that I never expected to, to make any money on. And, and really the real value of them, I thought, was just was just building relationships and networking. Um, and, uh, you know, making people aware of, you know, of what I was, who I was and what I was doing. Um, I mean, the thing is, is like the comments I've gotten from some people when it comes to like my business and everything is some people and other trainers have come and say, like, oh, well, you know, like it must be nice that you've, you know, you went to the Olympics and you played football and you have this great athletic background. It must really help you. And I would say that like in general, it kind of has, but not really. Like if anything, like it, it, it maybe like piques people's attention, like, oh, cool. Like you went to the Olympics and it ends up if we're doing a consultation, it's like a quick little, you know, one sentence. And then the question that it goes very quickly back to like, what are you going to do for me um, as a client? And so I guess, um, you know, really it's about, you know, you need, you need to, you need to, these people need to see you, they need to hear you. Um, you need to, even if you have all kinds of accolades or, or certifications or whatever, you need an opportunity to sit down with these people or meet them in person and really show them what you have to offer. Um, and so that's what I really wanted to do with these, with these workshops is really show them like what, um, a high performance, high level, uh, speed training environment, you know, should look like and how, you know, what, what you need to do to get faster. And, um, you know, what, one of the ways that I did that, I mean, as you remember with the, uh, the speed combine that I did in Guelph was I, I offered as kind of an extra little bit on top was, um, I did a, a video analysis. So everybody did the run. We recorded every, every sprint. And so for, you know, I think it was 10 extra bucks. Some of that you would get, you know, a five minute video analysis from me that you'd log into my website and you get this thing. And so that, that for me was an opportunity. I feel like to, you know, showcase my knowledge and my value. And that's the kind of stuff that pays, that pays you later down the road. Um, e even things that, like I would say that didn't really necessarily work out at the time. Like I had, um, I, I tried to do another workshop shortly after that in Oakville and I had two people show up and it seemed like a total bust. Um, but even just, but what ended up happening is that there was somebody in the facility who kind of knew me through the facility. They saw my, they saw my poster up, you know, realized that, Oh, wow, he's, he's doing, um, you know, specializes in speed. He's doing all this great stuff. And then I ended up, uh, you know, they ended up bringing their, their son and daughter to, uh, you know, to, to meet me, we did a consultation. And then now all of a sudden I, I've had these two kids for, you know, about a year and a half now, and they've been some of my most loyal clients. And then through them, through extension of them, I managed to get other, uh, referrals and everything as well. Um, so yeah, de definitely like you have to be, you gotta be smart about it. I, I don't advocate anybody like for me personally, I don't like giving away, like going, Oh, giving some stupid deal on, uh, on personal training sessions, like, you know, uh, 10 sessions for, you know, something, something super cheap, um, you know, 200 bucks or something. Uh, Cause I think it devalues the service that you offer, but, um, definitely, yeah, kind of these, you know, one-off workshops or opportunities that you have to, uh, show some value are, are good places to, to start, I guess. Going to transition to Sam uh, for a second here with uh, with another question. One of the things I want to highlight because it keeps coming up, and I think it's important, is that um, I think as established coaches, a lot of us need to do a better job of informing the people that we're working with and mentoring about the diverse things that we have our hands in. 
And um, I think there's a, a, a ton of these things here that people are mentioning that I'm sure a lot of us had no idea about. Um, Steve, I actually did know about that business that you had. I don't know why. I thought it was called Propel or something. But, you know, Jay, I think Jay brought it up about it not being a dirty word, like marketing or whatever it was that he said, or business or selling. And, and we need to be, up, I think, more upfront about that so that people can understand fully of how they can build a career for themselves that fits their life and not vice versa, right? Because coaching, like, yeah, it's really important. I think most of us think that to a large degree. But but it is about that, right? Like at the highest level, it's a transaction. And how do we make it fit for us? And when we know more fully about what our mentors are doing or what our colleagues are doing, um, I, I think it's more clear what the path can be. And it's not always, yep, this is who I work for. And that's what I do for 40, 50, 60, a million hours a week as a strength coach. It's like, no, it's a lot different than that. These are other things that I'm doing as well. This is These are things that I do for free or for fun. These are things that I do for very little money or for free to prospect. These are things that I do to diversify my resume, et cetera. And, and I think it's, it's really important for us to share those experiences. I'm going to transition to you, new, you now, Sam, about um, how you wanted to follow up with some of the panelists. Thanks, Jordan. So I've got two questions. I know we're going over time here, but um, I think these, these pieces are important, especially for those that are on the call and are just getting into the industry, um, or like some of you, uh, the two of you on the call, Jay and, and, and Mac, aren't the only ones that you know lost their positions that you've been in the industry for quite some time during the pandemic. But what advice, and maybe we can get Steve and Jay, and if Sheldon's, Sheldon's listening uh, here still, uh, what advice would you give to those right now um, that are either in that ladder building section or just graduating or even out of high school. And the reality is that our industry is unstable, way more unstable than it was before. And so what advice do you give those people? Um, I know you'll read in Derek Hansen's article that was posted earlier in the chat. Um, and he talks about, you don't even bother getting a sports science degree, get a business degree. And that's, you know, what he's kind of ex expressing to people um, given the instability that's going on currently. So for those that are looking to get in the industry or trying to make a pivot or, you know, just about to decide what they want to do, what advice do you guys have for them at this time? I don't know, Steve, you're still here? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, it's interesting. Um, you know, now that I've taken on more of a director role, um, you know, the, the budgeting and business aspect of things is, is becoming much more uh, required um, and skills that I'm continually learning as I go. Um, but I think that's probably the biggest piece uh, is making sure that you do have a bit of a business acumen to you. If you haven't read, uh, you know, Strength Coach CEO with Ron McCaffrey, then I, I suggest reading it because it does put a lot of pieces time you are learning and, and, and creating your niches in performance, whether that's, you know, uh, speed development, like Joey mentioned, or, or a variety of pieces, you, you constantly need to be looking around you and going, okay, what else can I do? What else can I get myself associated or involved with that still fits within my passion and, and, and my wheelhouse? So for a lot of people, it's more, um, you know, my encouragement is, is to yes take some business courses yes get good at budgeting and and, and uh, working with uh, you know, keeping your books and and, and uh, being in charge of your own budget and, and things like that but um, the other piece to it is uh, I, I always look to um, you know exos for me personally uh, I had a, a few internships there and I was always really uh, impressed by how they had both a corporate side and an athlete side and how it really didn't matter which way you went, if you came in as, a, as, a, as an accountant or you came in as an, a, an all-pro NFL player, you received very similar uh, approach and treatment. Yes, the programming was different. Yeah, yes, like maybe the diets were different and, and uh, you know, the work that the nutritionist did with you was different, but the treatment you received from the therapist, the, um, uh, the training that you received from the strength and conditioning coaches, the advice you received from, from the, the dietitians and, and uh, uh, nutritionists and recovery coaches, was very similar in approach and 
I think that's what really, um, I don't know, for myself, for the younger coaches, I, I disagree and agree with Derek's comments. I, I think you still need your, your education in physiology and, and, uh, and kinesiology, but um, can you still take courses on the side um, to help your business acumen as well? And at the same time, I think now more than ever, yeah, I mean, and Joey hit, hit the nail on the head and so did Mac. Like, yeah, yeah, you're working with athletes, but it doesn't mean you can't work with and offer the same services to their parents uh, and, and to groups. And, and, and not only that, but a lot of people are looking now for what is fitness now? What, how can I do fitness in isolation? How can I do fitness uh, remotely? How can I do it through uh, you know, virtual training? And I think now more than ever, you know, if you can come at them with uh, even a, even a a group of people that you agree to work with, a chiropractor, a physiotherapist, a performance coach, whatever, a nutritionist, and come with a package uh, of something that you can offer to corporate um, as well as performance, I think you, you set yourself up for success. A lot of people are afraid to network with others. A lot of people are afraid to, oh man, I, I need all those those dollars. If, if you offer a complete package to people, usually the, the recommendations come through tenfold. And so I, I think don't be afraid to, to, to work with others and, 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 uh, and set up a network where you know you're providing excellent care and quarterbacking that excellent care on behalf of those people who just don't want to think about it. I think that's one area that I would recommend for sure. Thanks, Steve. Sheldon, have any comments on you know some guidance you would give those trying to even start to get into the industry being where we are right now? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sam. And uh, definitely want to echo something that Steve just mentioned in terms of networking and uh, aligning yourself with others that complement what your skills and skill sets are. It doesn't have to be a business partner. I mean, my business partner and I, I mean, we're very fortunate that our skills complement each other, but it doesn't have to be in a formal business relationship determine what your weaknesses are and what your weak areas are and try and find somebody who's going to help you. And if it's not a business partner, then look for mentors and mentorship. I mean, the, the, one of the mentors that I've had for 25 years is in the theater industry, uh, entirely focused on business, but there are some meaningful, valuable conversations that I've had with him over the years that aren't necessarily related to fitness. He talks to me about his business and some of the dealings in his industry that are entirely applicable to any business, regardless of whether you're in fitness or not. And I think that's that's huge. Um, I, I would say that that people coming into the industry tend to focus on mentors within their own industry. Uh, you know, and I over the years, because I wanted to speak more at conferences, I actually hired an acting coach to help me with uh, with public speaking and be able to assess and analyze and critique me from from an acting perspective. So again, think about the skills that you are needing to. Uh, add to your toolkit uh, and then potentially look for mentors in this area. And I'm not saying that you need to be uh, an expert or have expertise in every area. That's absolutely not the case. I'm still a firm believer that you should try and pick something that you are going to be excellent at and then crush it, but then look at complementing those skills with uh, you know, partnerships, with mentors, with friends, with associates, with fellow students, with fellow coaches and trainers in the industry. I think that's, that's a huge asset. Uh, and the one thing that I will say as well, both my business partner and I early on, and, and we actually just celebrated our 29th year in business yesterday, our anniversary. And, and one thing that we actually recognized early on is when you have to be physically present and exchange time for money, that is not a great business model. What you need to be able to do if you're looking at sustainability is try and generate revenue when you are not physically present. And if you're able to do that, you know, whether it's renting space, whether it's selling products, uh, while it's setting, you know, training programs online, whatever the case is, if you can establish a business model and a paradigm where you don't have to be around to earn that dollar, uh, then that is a better more sustainable business model. I mean, but the, the quintessential example of that is something like Tim Hortons. You know, look at how many coffees they sell every hour, you know, and, and Joyce is not there or whoever, you know, the, the owners are not there or the franchise owner aren't there. So again, I think th those lines of thought and thinking really need to start early on you know, and determine how you're gonna generate revenue beyond your coaching business 
or there are there ancillary products that you're able to offer. Uh, again, and that's a recipe for long-term success. Thanks, Sheldon. Uh, I'm going to uh, switch it just a little bit here. And Jay, I think you're, um, you'll be able to add some comments based on some of the stuff that you're doing. But one thing we haven't talked about, I mean, it was briefly brought up a little bit, is social media. So what are your guys' thoughts, you know, even if you're in a job that has you in a good director position and you've got, you know, good money come in and you don't need to really show people necessarily what you're doing. Is social media the place that you need to do that still um, as you transition through every section? Do we think that, you know, there's no longer this idea of you can't be a social media person because that's the way the world and the industry is going. And um, I can't really speak to it because my social media presence is quite poor. Um, but is that a necessary thing for the pivot that we talk about with sport performance downsizing or this idea of ensuring that you have a brand and everyone can see it? And I mean, we, we have two athletes that we work with that you, they, have no, they don't have a cell phone, allegedly, and they don't check their email. And the only way that they will communicate is through Instagram, like legitimately. So, you know, I, I, I think it's here to stay for sure. But just some comments on that and uh, Jay I know you, you've been on it a bit and and Joey and some of the other programs university programs do a way better job than we do for sure and that's even in our Marcom section so Jay any thoughts on that um yeah I'm, I'm not gonna pretend that I'm I'm really good at it because I'm not um I was really late to the party um I thought it was, you know, the joke I always say is I, I didn't care what Kim Kardashian had for lunch. Like, that's what I thought Twitter was for and, and Instagram was for. Um, and then the more I, I started getting into it, the more I understood that it was about building connections with people and, and the amount of people I've met or connected with like in person, like not just DMing or information that I've gotten is, is well worth it. Um, when we talked about it in our mentorship program, I didn't pretend to know about it. Uh, I brought in someone who is a colleague and does a really great job of, of social media and marketing and, and has her own business and she talked to us about that and so um, it's something I'm growing with and trying to build all the time and really actually enjoys doing some of the graphic design stuff through through Canva which is like just a, a really super easy graphic design program um, and so I've enjoyed that part of it again it's it's a different side as far as creativity and, and, and artisticness and, and things like that and, um, but I'm definitely um, not as great as Joey, like Joey does a really great job of, of, of putting stuff out and, and, and promoting and things like that. And I, I forget half the time, but it's something that's like you said, Sam, it's not going anywhere. Um, how do we integrate it within what you do, but not to the point where you're coaching through a camera? Like, that's not what we're all trying to do, but is it, you know, and an, a, a placement student today like part of one you're here, you're going to take some stuff. Like you're going to just film some stuff and we're going to post it later or whatever the case is. Um, and something that I've also thought about and started to do is like starting to accumulate things. And so the other thing, again, like I'm an older guy is I thought when you see it, when you see a story, this is again, how dumb I am, that that's happening right now. And I was like, well, that's impossible because I'm talking to Joey and he just posted a story about, him working with the athlete and then when I started to realize it's like people just take this stuff and then over the you know when they have and they have content for like a month every Wednesday we're going to put this thing out but it's already done and so I've started to do that accumulate some things and, and then you know have consistency as far as every Wednesday I'm going to make a post about this but it's already finished and there's apps you can get that automatically post things on certain days and certain times like there's a lot of things to help you but um yeah let's uh, you know I'll stand a send a Sunday spend a Sunday creating some of these things on Canva and then be able to share them through the week really fast because I've already done them. So that's kind of a little, a little thing that I've picked up over the last little while, but. So uh, Trev's got to go in about three minutes here. So Joy, I'm just going to ask you if you could touch base on a little bit of advice for people that didn't really either don't have a social media account, haven't used it, maybe how, you, how important you think it is for all businesses or all levels of people. If you believe in that, uh, that are in uh in this industry and maybe some key takeaways or quick things that you really uh, feel has been time savers for you. Yeah, well, I definitely won't pretend to be any uh, social media influencer or anything like that. Um, um, I, it's something that um, 
yeah, like I, at first when I got into business, I was kind of like, oh, I don't really want to get into that social media stuff, kind of like, kind of like Jay. Um, but um, I found that that right away that it actually was uh, very good for uh, helping me to generate business. Um, so, I mean, whether you like it or not, um, if you are getting to the private realm, I think it is a necessity to have at least some kind of a presence on social media. Um, I'd say for me, like, uh, I mean, I, I definitely, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't have as much of a, uh, um, a system as, as Jay does. I, that's actually a, a good idea. I really should take a day to just sit down and plug out a bunch of stuff. But, um, you know, I try to, I try to make it as, as seamless as possible with, with what I'm doing, because I agree, like, you don't want to be coaching through a camera type thing. Um, the way I usually end up doing it, um, in, in a lot of cases is just, I, I'm doing a lot of like video work uh, with clients in general, um, just to go over uh, technique and uh, technical breakdown and whatnot and everything. So a lot of times, if you notice, a lot of my stories are really just kind of like clips that I've taken you know, from, uh, you know, working with athletes, like different sprints or drills that they're doing or whatnot so that we can talk about it in session. Um, but I, you know, generally speaking, I mean, my, my ultimate goal with it is that I just try I, my goal is to put out good quality content and I'm not so much concerned about, I'm not so much concerned about getting like tons of likes or the most shared posts around everything, because at the end of the day, like I'm trying to, I'm trying to attract a certain person, uh, to my brand, to my business. Um, I'm trying to attract obviously athletes who are looking to get faster. That's kind of the message. If you think of social media as like a loud, like a, like a megaphone that I'm yelling through, that's kind of what I'm trying to convey to people um, and also to other, uh, other coaches and uh, you know, coaches, therapists or whatever. So for me, like, you know, I'll, I'll get, you know, for, I'll, I'll see certain people follow me on Instagram. And if it's, if, it, if, if, you know, even if it's a, if it's a low number, but it's like another coach or another, or like some athletes from, from the area or something like that, to me, that's like a, that's a valuable, that's a very valuable follow right there. And uh, inevitably, like what ends up happening too with the athletes that you train, like all of them are on social media. Um, and uh, so you post video, you post videos about them running fast. And then next, you know, they share it, um, you know, share it on Instagram. And then all of a sudden you have, you know, they're obviously in connection with all these other athletes. So that it, it definitely helps to get uh, your message out there um, and your brand out there. So it's something that you definitely need to uh, get on top of, at least, at least in some capacity. I mean, I, I definitely could be, Lately, I haven't been as as regular with it. I mean, the stories I kind of get going every day, but with the posts, it, I'm kind of lagging behind a little bit. But it's more, yeah, from what I understand, it's more about consistency, being regular with it, so that your your message is constantly being heard um, by your audience. So. Yeah, thanks, Joey. And for all those that are in youth sport currently, uh, Instagram is the only recruiting tool that is really being used these days. So if uh, if your university does not have a good Instagram account, there are we are getting slammed. I'll tell you that we are, ours is not good. Um, so uh, that, that's definitely one lesson that I've learned. So, so we're going to wrap up here. Uh, thanks again for your guys' time. We've been about 15 minutes over. I just want to reiterate, because when we do record this and, and post it on the YouTube channel, um, they don't get to see some of the comments. And I think uh, some of the comments that Trevor made are worth, worth repeating again, just to kind of summarize some pieces. So one of the pieces that he did say was to maximize flexibility in your career, consider the following. Become an expert in a niche area, sprints, gymnastics, programming, tech, business. Two, make yourself someone they would hate to lose, interpersonal relationships. Three, create a worldwide presence via publishing, conference, and social media. Four, make friends with people more advanced in the industry. And five, understand your worth, don't be a doormat. And I believe he tried to get a little bit out of Joey when he, when he asked that last question. Um, and then ask yourself some questions if you're having a hard time growing or pivoting. Are you earning it or just expecting it? Have you done some of the small things well? Your resume is stronger than others. Have you been under the radar for more than a year, not involved in a variety of things, not interacting in the profession? And how would you justify your own pay if you owned your own business? Uh, I think those are all really good points in terms of how those are looking to pivot, especially in some of the instability that we're, uh, we're dealing with currently right now. Um, yeah, I think that's it from us, guys. Really appreciate your time. I know it was a little bit longer than today and uh, really glad that those that uh, were working in the industry and had to make a change or look to be doing well. So any support that we can always give uh, during that time as well is uh, for sure uh, looked up to. Anything, Jordan, Trev?
All good for me. Thanks a lot for everybody that contributed as always.